Right. Oof. We're being recorded. <laughs> you, don't, you have no idea how scary this is. However, thank you all very much for, for coming and for coming out tonight. We know how awkward it is in COVID times, but it's good. It's very good to see you all. We have something very special tonight because we've got people here, but we've got people who knows where else. Some, somewhere, I think there's some in the south of England, there's some on the Murray Coast, and we're bringing, we're bringing people in together. So it's, uh, it's uh, interesting. And we have, who do I see we've got? Well, we've got John Halliday, our own resident expert. Ta-da! We have... I want to go into screen sharing and see if we can see, who, see who's here. This might, be, this might be interesting. Well, that's... That's John and me. <laughs> Just in case you don't know, I'm Bill Sadler. And here, here, we, here we have uh, Leone Teufel, who is... South of England somewhere, I think. Yeah, and you're Bister. There you go. You see? <laughs> Five. <Woo>. And <laughs> Leon is uh, the, the project officer with AOC Archaeology and has run archaeology excavations and evaluations across the UK, particular north of Scotland and the south of England. Well spread. Previously completed their master's in practical archaeology with the University of Highlands and Islands, following an undergraduate degree in archaeology at Glasgow University. She was a site lead at the recent evaluation and subsequent excavation work at the distillery. Tonight she'll present results from the field's work and initial conclusions from the post-excavation program, which is still ongoing. She is aided and abetted by project manager Cathy, Cathy McKeever, who may or may not be somewhere lurking in the background. And we also have... Well, thanks. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> that, that. We, have, we have Matthew Garstein and uh, Ewan McIntosh from uh, Gordon and MacPhail. Uh, Matthew, who's been liaising with us, and we are enormously grateful. He is the finance director and strategic project manager. So you know, he knows everything about what's going on. And then we have Ewan McIntosh somewhere, who's the managing director. You may also have met on the way in Peter and Graham, our star turns as doorkeepers. You see, Peter's not letting you out <laughs> <laughs> until you have a oh, until, until you have a membership, <laughs> until you clear a donation, and until you bought a calendar. So other than that, you're very welcome. <laughs> now, for my next trick. Oh, there we have there we have you and welcome, welcome you and. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in what I imagine is a very busy schedule, but uh, we, look, we look forward to finding out what lies beneath. Oblige me by moving on. Wrong one. Shift from the man, the man I haven't introduced yet is Dave Calder, who's without Dave, we wouldn't be here because all of all of this is way, way beyond my pay grade. However, as uh, some background. The new distillery and very welcome distillery looks out towards the Cairngorm Mountains and overlooks the Spey, Scotland's fastest flowing river, famed for its timber floats in the 19th century, and of course, one of Scotland's finest fishing rivers. The pool just below the Cairn is Tyg Moor, and we're reminded how dangerous the river can be with a history of drowning and uh, not all the work of our very own Kelpie, the 
the white horse of Spain. The distillery sits in the shadow of Gatewood, Lagan Hill, and Benmore, all areas which have been inhabited for thousands of years, going back into the mists of time. Now, just before we start looking at all the background research and the archaeology, John will give us a little overview of some of the what we know about the, the archaeological sites. Good evening. Um, I'd like to state at the beginning, I'm not an archaeologist. I just enjoy um, walking over the, the land and identifying features usually from the old maps. Um, this um, it's a screenshot from environment, Historic Environment Scotland, uh, an aerial view over Cragan, Gaich, Ballantong, um, and the road and the old railway line. And these uh, dots uh, identifying features in the land that have archaeological interest. So I'll just point out some of them and uh, just briefly show where they are and what they are. So we've got the, the, We're going to start up here above um, Cragan and Gay on the slopes of Lagan Hill. It's the hill with the um, television mast on the top. Why? Am I clicking on the screen again? Um, so it was taken last year during the summer, and we were just starting to do the ground works at Cragan. Um, it's in that area there, just taking away the topsoil. And this is a, a Bronze Age cairn, so it's about uh, 4,000 years old, 2000 BC. And it's one of the best ones in this area. Originally, there would have been a mound of stones cairn over the top of it. And this is a kiss where the burial um, would have been. So it's, it would probably have been uh, a beaker with ashes that had been interred there. Um, a lot of the cairns in this area have been robbed for, for building purposes. So the stones in this area have been used for building dikes, but in other areas have been used for building um, houses and sheep pens. So it's got a beautiful view. You're looking south towards the Cairn Gorms, Cromdell Hills, and the River Spees down here, and the distillery. Um, I think this angle is just about here. It'd be more obvious today if you go back to this site. So that's another view. That's another view of it. There's the distillery there. So this is just at the beginning of the construction for the um, as we're doing the, the land clearance. So again, you can see the kiss, there's like a gable stone at each end, and there's been a stone on the left and the right, and then the tournament in the middle, and then a mound of stones over the top. Again, that's the kiss. So it's just a box-like structure with a gable stone at each end. Now this is further up the hill above Upper Geek. Um, it's just a care of stones. Again, it's been robbed, but the kiss, if there is one, hasn't been exposed. Now, on the old, this appears in the first edition on the survey map, about 1870. They did another survey in the 1960s and said the site was lost. They couldn't find it due to the density of the forestry. And this site and another one that I'll show you were reported as missing. Or the, you know, the, the ground had, um, the trees had destroyed them. However, in about 2006, they did another survey and they managed to find both of them. So if you, if you go to the Upper Gate Farm and just walk a few hundred yards into the woods, you will see a great big pile of stones. Um, so this is another burial cairn, probably from the Bronze Age. <clears throat> now lower down, um, this is just into the wood above Croft Scaly. Um, and again, it's another Bronze Age burial cairn. 
the, all the stones have been removed for building purposes and you're just left with this natural boulder on the left and then there's a one gable stone there with the kiss and one on the right and the one near this is missing. So again, the interment would have been in this area here, but all around about it, the stones have been removed. It's been used as a midden. If, if you go to, there's there's tin cans and bits of ironmongery that have been discarded there from the houses along the road, the old Dalman Road. Um, but if you walk past it, it's, it's hard to see. It's just this natural boulder sticking up. Um, and all the stones that we saw in the previous care, they've all been removed. Now we move down to Ballon Tom. Ballon Tom is the farmstead of the hillock of the hill. Gallic name is Tom the Carrach, which means the hillock of the pillars, the pillars being the standing stones. <clears throat> so there's four um, that you can see. There's one uh, on the hillock just beyond it, the cheese there. So this one standing its own, and then towards me, if you're looking at it, there's another two stones, one lying on the side and one still upright. Mm -hmm. They are date from probably again Bronze Age and probably for um, astronomical use. There are people who've done various surveys of them, and at various times of the year, you can use the stones to uh, see the setting sun or the rising um, setting sun in midwinter around about December the 20th. First, um, the problem with a lot of these sites and, and, and throughout Strathspey is very few of them have been explored archaeologically, and so we don't really know that much information about them. Um, Ballantong is again of significance because it was a gathering place of the Clan Grant, um, the rallying point, and this this point has obviously been a feature that people have been associated with for thousands of years. Um, in 1710. The chief Ludwig handed over control of the clan to his son, Brigadier Alexander Grant, and the clan gathered here. They were summoned to this point, and the instructions were that they had to gather wearing um, green, uh, tartan of green and red. So it's one of the earliest uh, comments about the clan grant and what tartan they were using. So that was in 1710. It was also the site of the local regality courts and a place where. Uh, corporal punishment was dealt out, and the gallows are situated at this site too, on Bellantol. So it was a significant gathering, gathering point. Also, later the Figgit Fair was held for some years at this site before it was relocated. Another unusual feature, just um, beside the stones, is this cross that's been dug into this, into this hillock. It's known as the Cross of Bellantol. And really, that's all we know about it. We don't know what its significance is or its age. Again, we need an archaeologist to tell us. Um, but it's known as the Cross of Ballantal. And finally, it's not the clearest picture. There's a Pictish class stone. Um, you can see a crescent. I can't really see the sign. There's a crescent and there's a bee rod. And then but no, beneath it, there's a feature that looks like a tuning fork. It's a rectangle with two, two extensions. Um, this is now known as the Finlarg stone. It's, it's built into the dike at Finlarg House. But originally it came from Ballantong and it was used either as a lintel or a food um, paving stone at the entrance to the Ballantong farmhouse, the old Ballantong. When it was this feature was um, face down. And when they um, demolished the house, they found the stone and it was relocated to the Finlark house and built into the wall. But it originally came from Ballantal. Where exactly, we don't know. That's been lost. It could have been close to where the standing stones are today. So we've got something that's from the Bronze Age. We've got something from the Pictish period. We've got historical records of the clan grant being associated with it. So Ballantal and Kragan and Gake of, you know, huge things uh, historical things. And finally, this is the spay, and again, uh, there was a ferry crossing point here, both of Valley Firth on the Abernethy side, and the ferry used to cross to uh, the hill beside Valentong, and I believe that was used up until about the early 1920s, ferry point at Valentong, or Valley Firth. Okay, so this is just a brief overview of what's in the locality. Thank you very much, John. Our, our plan now is that we're going to ask uh, 
either, either Ewan or Matthew to give a little background to some of the enormous amount of work that has to go on before the first digger ever, ever sets foot on the site. We will then go to Leonie, who will talk to us about the actual work that uh, she and her team have been carrying out. So, uh, Matthew, Ewan, who's, 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 who's been volunteered for this? Uh, I'm, I'm volunteered for this first piece. Um, thanks, Bill, and good evening, everyone. Um, so I was just going to give a, a, a brief overview of the, some of the um, environmental and um, ecology work that we did uh, on the site before anything could happen on it. Um, so we worked with, uh, with a number of specialists to um, understand the site and the survey, uh, survey various parts of it before we could do anything. Uh, in particular, I suspect most of you know Pete Cosgrove, who we did quite a lot of work with as well, and he supported us with this. So for those that did read it at the time, the, uh, the within the planning application, there was uh, a very extensive um, EIA done, environmental impact assessment done. But just to touch on one of the um, chapters, and that was the ecology chapter. So we, we did... A number of surveys um, covering, um, so I'd list them all, but some of the, the big ones, for example, were various mammal surveys, um, looking at bat surveys for the, along the trees, along the river, um, all the breeding bird surveys. Pete also did the, the freshwater pearl mussel survey for us. Um, so uh, that was obviously quite a sensitive survey that we did. Obviously, we couldn't publish the results um, so that nobody knows where they are. Um, we also um, had a number of other river surveys alongside to do with electric fishing and sort of different habitat surveys, as well as the, the various sort of breeding waders. So there's a lot of different in river and on ground um, ecological surveys that we did. I, I suppose the, the big thing which came out of it, which we were aware of ultimately, um, the land where the distillery is more recently has always been uh, farmed. Um, so because of that, um, there's not really been um, much by way of um, uh, sort of animals on there, sadly, so that it was known for oyster catchers and breeding, breeding waders. They would often see them each year, uh, small numbers, but sadly uh, just wouldn't survive because it was all farmed and cut grass or grazed grass. There was nowhere for, for the breeding waders or the oyster catchers to, to hide or uh, away from prey. So whilst the eggs would be found, they never actually survived. Um, so really, the key for us when we sort of took on the development of the site was to work with the specialists to talk about how we could improve, improve the site, because to be honest, there wasn't a lot identified from the surveys in terms of existing ecology on there. So there are a number of things that we've done or built into the, the site and the distillery to try and improve uh, and enhance uh, habitats. So for example, the, the distillery itself has a green roof or a turf roof, um, which is due to go on next week, I think. So, uh, I mean, we've been talking about it for a while. It's been delayed and delayed, but that is due to go on next week. Uh, I understand from Pete that he thinks it's the largest green roof in the Kangol National Park, so um, should attract some interest. Uh, but that, again, he believes is an area where, which will be popular for um, oyster catchers. Um, so that should help there. Similarly, there are a number of areas down the side of the site and actually on Grant, um, the farmer next door, his land where we put some scrapes in um, for breeding waders. And actually what we've seen this year on site, there has been some successful uh, breeding waders using those areas. So one of the first times in a long time where we've actually successfully seen um, breeding waders actually hatch and survive um, because of the scrapes that have gone in. Um, one of the other um, aspects we'll be doing there is a, I think a pond is a generous term for it, but there's an area, a wetland area uh, on the side of the site towards the A95, um, which has always sort of been used by sort of cattle and sheep. Um, we took that within the site in the end um, because we felt it would be better in the site and that it will be um, dug out shortly and lined uh, and reinstated as a, a natural pond. Um, which will become a natural habitat for um, dragonflies. So that will be happening shortly as well. 
And similarly, the landscaping will, will start to take place where we're doing quite a lot of tree planting. And within that, there's a lot of aspen going in and that will join up the start to join up some of the aspen yeah. corridor. Um, what we've already done this, this year, though, which is, was quite exciting for the site, um, and we'll, we'll see more of that once the tree planting takes place, we've actually put a number of bird boxes on certain trees down by the river for the golden eye ducks. And we actually saw successful breeding of golden eye ducks this year. Um, so it was kept relatively secretive because they are um, endangered uh, and we actually did result in successful breeding there. Um, I'm sure there's people who know a lot more about them than me, but P has informed me that they have uh, very effectively spongy and springy bones. Uh, and when they hatch, they just roll out of the, uh, the, the nest and just plummet to the ground and land on the ground and survive. Um, but I'm sure Pete can explain in a lot more detail than I can. Um, so already the good thing is despite construction obviously underway at the moment, we've really seen some uh, positive um, breeding, um, which, which the site, which hadn't happened on the site before. Um, so that's been, that's been really good to see. We do have the, the weekly ecology visit from Pete, so he makes sure that during construction um, everything is in place and secure and, and friendly from the ecology side. So it's making sure all the pipes, for example, are covered at the end so they can't go in. If there's any work or any holes being dug, actually little steps have to be left such that if an animal does fall in, they're able to climb up the steps to get back out of the hole. Um, so there's been a, there's been a lot of uh, work uh, undertaken on the site around that. Um, and then the final thing I was just going to touch on, just back to the river, obviously, uh, the river space is incredibly sensitive. So there's two, two elements I was going to mention there. We do have the, uh, the cooling water used in the distillery. We extract that from the river spay uh, and that goes through the process and is returned to the river spay. Um, so we've done a lot of work there um, to do with temperature modelling um, and looking at the thermal modelling to see how quickly... Um, the temperature disperses um, so as the water returns into the river it does disperse incredibly quickly uh, and we will continue to monitor that under our CEPA requirements just to make sure there's no impact on the, the pearl mussels or the salmon um, and that outflow was was installed um, a couple of months back all successfully which was good um, and then the final point which was a slight change from the planning but again is, is better for the river spay we were originally for that cooling water going to extract it from the river spay directly, which would have meant putting an intake into the spay and various works to the river spay. But what we'd be able to develop with some of the specialists we work with is actually a borehole system now, which is uh, just uh, above the river spay. So whilst it's extracting, obviously, from the same same source, essentially, uh, it's meant we've not had to do in-stream river works, which has been good. So we've put three boreholes in, um, again, which has helped protect any work within the spay in terms of the installation, but also going forward for, for routine maintenance. Um, so yeah, so that was just a, a high level overview of the ecology side of things. Thank you very much indeed. It shows just how much work goes on that we, we perhaps don't even see or know about. Um, our key focus tonight, however, is not on the ecological side, but on the archeological side and so uh, Leone has very kindly agreed, one way or the other, to uh, come and come. It's a bit tricky when they're not here. You can't come when you're not here. You see how the difficulties I've got? Anyway, <laughs> look, she's, she's still smiling. I haven't upset her yet. And so thank you very much indeed, Leone. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so let me know if that is working. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's good. Thanks. Cool. Brilliant. So I'm going to be presenting on the archaeological work that we've gone, done for Gordon and MacPhail on the land um, at the uh, Kragan Distillery. So as most of you will know, uh, this is the location of the distillery. So it's on the outside of uh, Granton on Spey, south of the golf course. And the land comprised of mainly flat or slightly sloping um, agricultural land, which then starts to slope slightly st steeper towards the southeast end of the site, where it goes down towards the river Spey. So before any um, work can start on site, 
uh, if there's any chance of archaeology being present on site, a um, planning condition will be put in place to do some archaeological mitigation. So this started off with us doing um, some evaluation trenches, which are just two meter wide trenches dug by a machine. You can see the plan of the trenches on the map there. Um, so during this evaluation work, we ended up locating two areas with uh, lots of archaeology in it. So because of that finding, we required to be present during the site strip, which is called a watching brief. So that involved an archaeologist monitoring the site being stripped of topsoil and then spotting any archaeology and subsequently excavating and recording the archaeology that we found. Um, so before we started work on site, we knew that there was lots of archaeology known around in the landscape, but on the site itself, we weren't sure what there was going to be. Um, so it was quite a good opportunity to go in and um, find out about stuff. Um, now, we completed the field work in August of 2020, and after that, we started our post-excavation analysis which is where we analyze the soil samples that we take, we analyze the finds, and we do any radiocarbon dating. Um, so as was mentioned, um, this program is still ongoing, but I'm going to be presenting on our findings so far. So this is the map that shows where the archaeological features are. So we had three main areas um, of archaeology. We had the northern area where we had the most um, archaeological features, including five roundhouse structures. We then, in the central of this area of the site, had a single uh, four-post structure. And then at the south end of the site, we had an isolated roundhouse um, by the river. So you might have heard me talking about roundhouses and might be a bit like, oh, what are they? So this is a reconstruction drawing that has been done by Tanya Romankovic showing you of what a roundhouse would have looked like from the inside. Um, and then on the uh, right, you'll see a bird's eye view or plan of what we would expect to find when we're excavating a roundhouse. So a roundhouse would have usually had a turf wall that would have gone around the outside. And this often doesn't survive in the archaeological record. Um, but what we do often have surviving is the internal post ring. Um, and associated with that, you then the sorry, the post ring would have held up the roof. Um, and then other features that you sometimes get on the inside of them are ring ditches or pits. Um, a ring ditch is essentially an area where either animals or humans have worn down the ground and you therefore get a natural hollow created. This natural hollow, this hollow is then often either um, filled back in or used for craft activities or um, manufacturing and will often then also have waste material um, deposited into them. So this is a map of, of the northern area showing the roundhouse structures that we found. So on the top of this map you can see a great example of a uh, post ring structure with a porch we then also on the left and on the bottom of this map have um, some roundhouses with ring ditches. And in amongst that, we have a bunch of other um, pits um, and other features. So I'm now going to talk you through the structures in a bit more detail. Uh, this is structure A. Um, structure A composed of a segment of ring ditch and um, a post ring. The post ring was not well defined and we really only had four post holes that were definitively on the, the line of the ring. Um, and the internal space that this roundhouse would have um, enclosed would have been roughly 6.3 meters in diameter. Uh, the segment of ring ditch contained this uh, beautiful cornstone that you can see in the photo on the left. Um, there are um, this type of sorry, this type of cornstone would be classed as a low bun-shaped cornstone. Now you might be wondering what 
what is a corn. So a corn is used for grinding uh, grain down to flour. Um, and this flour can then be used to create bread or other products. There are different types of corns, but the types of corns that we got from the Kragen site are rotary corns. And those work by having two stones placed on top of each other that in the middle will have some um, a spin the, holding them together. And the upper stone will then often have a handle, which you then use to, to turn the stone, which then grinds the flour. So this stone, um, you can see on the left there, has a well-worn handle socket. So this is the upper stone uh, for a quern. Um, this particular stone is a dense mica risk rich schist, which is not the best type of stone to use um, for a quern because it tends to break easily, which means that you end up with a lot of stone in your flour, which then makes your bread very gritty, um, which is not ideal because it wears down your teeth. However, this stone seems to have been specifically chosen because at the bottom there was a vein of quartz running through it, and quartz is quite hard and is a good grinding surface. So this is another example of a roundhouse. This is structure E. Um, structure E also had a post ring which had eight post holes and the post ring would have been 6.1 meters in diameter. It also had two post holes that might have formed a porch at the east end, which is where the entrance to the structure might have been. It also had a segment of ring ditch and within the ring ditch, it had this very nice flat uh, surface made out of stone, which you can see in the photo on the right. Um, this stone surface um, is quite interesting and when we did when we've done the analysis of the soil samples that we've taken from amongst the stones we've found evidence of slag charcoal hazelnut shell and bone this could suggest that the stone surface um, might have been related to metalworking or other craft activity um, so that's quite interesting and nice. Uh, a very similar stone surface was found at the northern end of the site. However, this stone surface was on its own. There was nothing around it um, that would indicate that there's more of a structure to it. This could either be because um, it's been truncated by, by plowing or other activities, um, or it might not have been an enclosed structure. However, again, when we've done the soil analysis for this feature, um, we found lots of slag um, and uh, bone, which suggests that maybe, again, this surface could have been used for um, metalworking. So this is structure D. It's slightly different in that it doesn't have a ring, uh, ring ditch around it but you can see how nicely spaced this post ring is and how well it's survived. It also has a very nice um, porch, which is the entrance, which are those two post holes that you can see coming out on the east. So that again is where the entrance to the structure would have been. And um, that's quite interesting because typically um, most roundhouses tend to have their entrances um, on the southeast. Um, but when we were excavating, we noticed that the weather would often approach from the south or the southwest. So it obviously it makes sense to have your entrance facing away to the weather. And that's probably why the entrance to these roundhouses are facing to the east, because it'd be more sheltered. Um, what was also interesting about this roundhouse is that for most of the post holes, we had the post pipe surviving. Um, so the post pipe is a result of the posts um, that uh, rotting in situ. So you get a lighter fill in the in the middle, and that could indicate that this structure has decayed over time rather than being deliberately destroyed. So we then have quite a different structure. This is structure B. It comprised of a stone lined hearth, which you can uh, see on the right there. And then around it, it had about 
eight associated post holes, but these post holes, again, don't form as nice of a structure. So the post holes that enclose the structure might not have been circular and it's not easy to say what the shape is and how to define the structure, but we have this very nice um, stone build hearth in amongst it. We then also had this large oval pit that contained many fragments of stone. One of the stones is this stone that you can um, see on the right. And this is a rough out for a corn stone. So this is where they've taken a big stone and they've started to shape it down to a corn. But for whatever reason, they never finished it. Instead, they dumped it in this pit with lots of other stone. Um, so this could suggest that on the site, we don't only have evidence for corns being used, but we, we also have evidence for corns being produced on site, um, which is quite interesting. Other features that we had in this northern area included um, some slag ridge pit, pits. Um, this photo is of a pit that ha actually has four different pits intercutting themselves. So when we've done our um, a soil analysis of this feature, we uh, found a lot of uh, slag, hammer scale and charcoal. So this is evidence for iron working on the site. So slag is the waste material that you get when you smelt down the raw material that then creates iron. Hammer scale is uh, the result of iron smithing. So when you hammer iron small sparks fly off and when those then cool that's what hammer scale is um so we don't have evidence here for large scale um metal working but we have um probably evidence of the manufacturing and maintenance of everyday um tools or household items um so that's very very nice and the final structure that we had in the northern area was structure G. It comprised of a segment of ring ditch. And within this ring ditch, we had a um, cremation pit. So the cremation pit was a very shallow pit that was filled with tiny pieces of bone. Those are the wee white flecks that you can see in the photo on the right. Um, these bones have been analyzed by our post-excavation specialist, who has determined that they're the remains of one adult male. We haven't yet been able to date the bone, so we don't yet know whether this cremation burial is contemporary with the, the structures that we have, or whether it pre or post dates um, this activity. So that's given you a bit of an overview of the northern area. So I'm now going to talk about the central area. Um, the central area contained a couple of isolated pits and then also this uh, four post structure, structure H. Structure H had four um, post holes, each of which had an associated pit located to the southwest of it. This structure would have measured 3.1 meters by three meters. Um, and when we've done the soil analysis of this feature, we found lots of charcoal, cereal and bone. Um, so we have good material here for radiocarbon dating. Um, other sites where they found these four post structures, they are often dated to the early prehistoric period. So um, this might be evidence of a different earlier um, settlement, but we won't know that for sure until we get the radiocarbon dates. So finally, I'm going to talk about structure C, which is um, a small round house, which is located on the river terrace that overlooks the river space. It is made up of 10 post holes um, that form a post ring, which measured 5.7 meters in diameters. It also had two pits and a segment of ring ditch. When we analyzed the ring ditch and the, the pits, we found evidence of lots of cereal um, in, in them, which suggests that 
grain was being processed here which is an interesting link since the site will now again uh, be used for grain processing and distilling. Related to this, we also, this is structure C, related to this, we also found um, three beautiful rotary querns within the ring ditch. Um, so these are disc-shaped querns, um, which are thin and wide and have a flat surface. The ring, these querns that we found were complete. We have evidence that they were well used um, and that these are the basal stones for them because they don't have the hand um, socket to turn the querns. Um, <clears throat> the, as you can see in the photo, the these corn stones seem to have been deliberately placed very evenly and following the curve of the, the ring ditch, which suggests that they were probably intentionally placed. Now, the question would be, what is the significance of this? Um, were, are these at more evidence that this was a grain processing structure, or were they just convenient stepping stones over a muddy ditch? We don't know and won't be able to tell, but they're very pretty. <laughs> so we've done some limited radiocarbon dating on the res results of the features that we got from the evaluation stage, but we're still waiting for more radiocarbon dates. So far, we have a clear late Iron Age date, which is from the first to the third century AD. And this date is coming from structure C, which is the structure that I just talked about. And we have one post hole from structure A, um, which is in the Northern area, which also dates to this um, first to third century AD date. From comparing the other roundhouses that we have with the dates that we have, the roundhouses are all very similar in size and shape. And this would possibly lead us to suggest that um, there, the other roundhouses are also of a late Iron Age date from the first to third century, but we're still waiting for more radiocarbon dates to um, confirm this. We then have a later phase of activity, which is from the 9th to 10th century AD. And this date came from the hearth feature in, in structure B. So this is probably also why both structure A and structure B are slightly hard to pick apart because we have a later phase of activity within the vicinity of earlier. So essentially someone's come back many years later and is built on top of a pre-existing structure. But the structure wouldn't have been upstanding anymore. They just chose to be in the same vicinity. So um, other archeology span in the area um, at Beecham Court, um, they uh, found an arc of post holes, some prehistoric pottery um, and some other pit features. Um, this uh, and other features in the wider landscape as have already been talked about earlier. There's a couple of hut circles up in the hills. There's uh, the Neolithic uh, cairns and the standing stones. Um, <clears throat> both the standing stones and the Neolithic cairns likely predate the activity that we have evidence for. Similar sites in the wider landscape that are similar to what we found at Cragen are Granton Road in Forest, where they found a range of different sizes of ring ditches and post ring structures, as well as four post structures. And they also had evidence for metalworking. A slightly larger scale example of what we had at Cragen could be found at Burney in Murray, where they uh, found many more and larger roundhouses. And this area is thought to have been um, a key center in the local area. So the addition of the Kragen site to the archeological record really expands our knowledge of the everyday late Iron Age society. 
So in conclusion, we at Kragen, we found a late Iron Age rural agricultural settlement comprising of at least six roundhouses and associated st structures and um, activities areas. We had evidence for everyday activities such as corn production, grain processing, iron working. We have evidence for both smithing and smelting. We possibly have an earlier funerary activity on the site, but this needs to be clarified with further um, radiocarbon dating. And we then have a later settlement from the 8th and 9th century, which is evident from just one structure so far. Um, so I would like to say thank you to the fieldwork team um, and I'd like to say thanks to the client, to, to Matthew from Gordon and McPhail, who funded the, the work and also to Morrisons who were the construction team on the site and Gary who was the site lead and to our post -ex team. Um, I'd also like to thank you for inviting me to present today and I'm happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Wow. Thank, thank you very much. What, a, what an exciting detective story, piecing all those, those bits together and, and leaving us still with just a, a, little, a little bit still to, still, to, still to find out. But it's just to try to picture that site with the, the roundhouses and the settlement, I think, is, is particularly interesting. Now, um, I think probably we'll save questions for a little bit later, if that's, if that's all right. And we'll go across to Matthew and Ewan, really to bring us up to date with the, the story of the Cairn. And then we can have a, an open question and answer session, if that's okay with everyone. Um, that, that'll be over to me then. Um, Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, and and, uh, and firstly, can I just say, Leone, thanks very much for that. That's, that's, a, that's really been interesting for, for me as well. I think it's really interesting to see that connection with uh, milling and you know processing of grain, metal working, you know, copper stills. I'm not so keen on the funeral part of it right enough, but uh, the, um, the, the, the things that we can use as part of the story of the distillery are really interesting from the, the, the research you've done. Having been up there on Tuesday when it was rather cold, I can understand why that roundhouse porch was facing to the east, to be honest. It was uh, it was rather chilly. Um, I am just going to share my screen as well, just to um, uh, sort of show you the sort of the, the progress we've been making so far. Um, can everyone see that as a picture? No. Um, are we good? Um, so it's it's actually almost a year today since um, we started the steelwork at the distillery. This picture has been seen, or this this landscape has been seen in a couple of images so far today. Um, but um, in November last year, we we started the steelwork erection, um, and. To this point, over the last 12 months, um, we have been absolutely delighted with progress. Um, you know, you, you, um, the granting community have been seeing the distillery coming out of the ground, um, but it's been a, a real exciting time for us that, you know, we only get up every couple of weeks and there was there's just phases with the, the construction progress that you turn up and you, you see a, a vast amount of work happening. Um, and that initial stages were very much the, were very much the case. We've been lucky we've got these time-lapse cameras on site. We've got a number of them dotted around the site and um, they've been fascinating and quite addictive, to be honest, as you every day you sort of go in and have a look at them and see what else is happening. And you get quite frustrated when stuff isn't happening, but um, a lot of it now is inside. So this is us starting really to get the, um, the, the main structure of the distillery up. Um, and you're now starting to see the concrete structure um, uh, starting to form on the right-hand side. And again, very similar to that sort of roundhouse. There's a nice, again, connection back to some of the historical aspects on the site. The, um, we were actually incredibly quick in getting all the, the distilling equipment in. It's been one of the factors that's been pointed out on the, the project 
in that a lot of normal construction, distillery construction projects would wait until the building is complete. And then the distilling equipment is, would go in. But uh, we started this process very quickly, working with Forsyth in, um, in, in Rothis. Part of that was because, you know, in terms of getting the kit in, um, you, you had to uh, put it in before the roof goes on, etc. cetera. Um, because we are building this distillery um, for its, uh, with its final capacity almost. There's, there's, there's going to be a couple of things that we can put in afterwards, but the major equipment needs the roof off as you drop it in. So, um, you know, we, we very quickly got all of the, the main vessels in into the site and then we could start the, um, the process of, of wrapping it. But as the, um, as the equipment went in um, and as, you know, into the frame of the building, you really started to see the, um, the vista that visitors will get as they come around the site. So this is, this is standing in the stillhouse looking west towards the Cairngorms. You see three of our, our stills here on the left-hand side. There's another three on the right-hand side. And you can see our sort of very modern-looking spirit safe sitting in the middle there, wrapped in bubble wrap. But um, that is now all windowed. The windows are in and that's that bit there. And this, this, the, um, the spectacle of standing in that still house, it will be one of the best views from a still house anywhere in Scotland. It is, it is absolutely stunning. But the, um, the, construction, the construction process has, has, has continued at a pace. Um, delighted with the, 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 the sort of building starting to come to life with the cladding going on and some of this sort of uh, the, the block work and uh, going around the, um, the lower part of the building. Um, and you really are starting to see the, the real shape coming together. Um, and this is, a, this is a picture in the last couple of weeks. So we're really starting now to see the, the distillery design, the architectural aspects of the distillery. Um, as Matthew says, we've been waiting for this grass roof to go on for some time to get that scaffolding off the roof. But we're starting to see the, the visitor center being formed the, um, the, at the moment it's block work, but it's, it's being clad at the moment in sandstone um, as per the, the designs. Um, and you know, we're absolutely really chuffed at the moment as to where we've got to. Um, you can start to see how the distillery is going to bed in. Um, at the moment it is very much still a building site, you know, and it is quite difficult to see the, you know, what the, the final sort of picture will look like but I think this kind of photograph tells us that you know that as we wanted the distillery kind of hunkers down into its location once we get the landscaping done once we get the tree planting done you know hopefully it is going to be a great addition uh, to the national park um, and you know the the process where we're at, at at this stage we're in the the building is pretty much wind and water type from the distillery side of things and um, for sites have started their commissioning um, so they're doing a lot of electrical testing um, and over the coming sort of weeks and months, they'll move into sort of testing the, the vessels with water um, and we should be commissioning the, the, the equipment and the stills with spirit um, in January. Uh, the visitor centre is a little behind that. Um, the visitor centre has obviously got a lot of input from our brand and marketing people. Um, and that's, you know, with all due respect to anyone who's in brands and marketing in the room, um, does tend to slow the process down a little bit. Um, so the visitor centre we probably anticipate will be completed um, around April time. Um, and our, our ballpark for the distillery opening um, is probably mid to late summer. Again, we want to ensure that when we start taking visitors on site, um, the, the landscaping is all complete, um, everything's starting to grow and it's not, it's not just a muddy field that the, the builders have just vacated. So we want to give it a good couple of months to um, to for everything to bed in, and uh, and and become green. But um, we're absolutely, as I say, absolutely delighted with where we're at. Um, pro progress has been really, really good. Um, Lonnie, Lonnie mentioned Morrison's. I think we've been we've been really impressed with Morrison's. Gary and his team, they've run a a, a really good operation up there. Um, it's a busy site at the moment. Anyone who drives past it is incredibly busy. We have up to 70, 80 contractors on site at the moment. So um, it, is, it is busy. Um, it is now just a, a, a typical building site where we have to, and Gary and his team have to manage everything. Uh, a delay now does knock on anything. Um, everything, sorry. The, well, previously, the, the project, you could move people around and it was quite easy to balance jobs. 
there are so many jobs now which are basically dependent on someone else that if that person does, is unable to do their job, there is a knock on. But um, to this point, that's there's not been many many issues with that. We we were able to sidestep most of the the supply issues that were in the news over the last sort of six eight months because we started the the uh, the process you know as soon as we could in in lockdown as soon as construction was allowed to get going we started um that has served us really well because we all our steel work was tendered all the main components were tendered so it's it's only now that we see some slight delays in some electrical components but we've sidestepped the majority of, of supply issues and associated price increases, which is very pleasing as well. So we're fundamentally in a great place. Um, um, and we really look forward. The, 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 this has been a really quick year for us. I think the, the, the construction has, has, has gone at pace. And I'm sure the next six months until we get the distillery handed over, um, hopefully we'll go as quickly. And we just can't, we can't wait to get in. Exciting times. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's uh, it's good to, to hear the progress and to and to realise that you know every, everything's running running to schedule. At which point, um, I'm sure there's a there's a lot of questions. Some of which people like me. Tomorrow I'll say I wish I'd asked that. Or when the meeting's closed. Oh, I wonder if we could. Well, now's your time. So if we have any questions, we have, assuming our technology is working, oh, there's a man with a microphone. Are you going to take that round or shall I? Oh, look at that, it's, it's, it's perfect. Um, I just, uh, prerogative of the chair, ask Leone, what sort of population might you have uh, envisaged on that, on that site? Um, it's very hard to tell till we know the chronology a bit better. Um, it could either have been one family that's, you know, moved from roundhouse to roundhouse, or it might have been a small settlement area that was built and they were all um, contemporary. So, you know, anything from a family to, to larger, it's a bit hard to, um, to tell, unfortunately. Who has a who's going to question, question at, the, at the front? Uh, will I speak? Right? My microphone's coming. An because... associated question, really, is how isolated do you think this uh, community would be, and how close would other communities be to this one? Uh, probably very close. I mean, we have the great location of being by the river, um, and that would have probably been a feature as well when um, the site was occupied. So waterways are a much quicker way to get around in the past. And, you know, today we often do see them as a bit of a hindrance by we have to build bridges over them and the sea is a, a barrier. However, in, in that time, the sea and rivers and bodies of water would have been a good way of um, getting around. So I think they would have been fairly inter interconnected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a question for Leone, and it's really about what um, has happened to those archaeological sites that were found. Are they being preserved, or have they, they now been assumed into the building of the, of the new distillery? Um, so, if you're talking about the features that I've found, so ar archaeology and unfortunately isn't the right word, but archaeology is quite a destructive process. So we obviously go in, we identify the features, we clean them, and then we have to excavate them. So during excavation, which we need to do to understand what features are and what's going on, um, we then destroy 
well, we don't destroy them, but we dig them as they were once dug. And we then go and we record them and we create a digital and photographical and written record of what was there. And from that, we can then later on create the story and um, get all the information. And as we're doing our work, we're also taking soil samples. And from that, you know, we can get dates and information about their environment and stuff. So as we go, we're removing the archaeology. So the structures are only recorded in photographic and digital way. So um, they're no longer there, but um, us digging them, unfortunately, does often tend to remove the archaeology. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Just a, oh, well, yeah. David. It's really the water that's used for the distillery. Uh, is it right that you're taking it from boreholes in space? In which case, any water that you would use would need to be analysed and make sure that it's uh, consistent. Is that sort of system in, in situ? I can I can take that one, Matthew. Um, yeah, absolutely. The, well, there's, there's two types of water. Um, the the water which we use for cooling um, is is simply that we don't have to analyze it. It doesn't. It's not used for whiskey making as such. It is just really it's used for cooling the vapors. The processed water which is is used in the the, the mashing process. Yeah, we would look for consistency. So um, with the with the boreholes, um, we've done some analysis um, of the water. Um, and we would we would look for that fingerprint of the water to say consistent, you know, throughout the year as we as we draw it. So um, uh, that that'll be an ongoing process. Um, and we've got we've got two boreholes on site, and um, but we've also got access to um, uh, water from the Glenbeg Burn as well. So um, the, the water quality, you're absolutely right, is is um, it's imperative that it stays consistent because different waters will impact the quality of mashing. Slightly, um, so it's uh, it's an aspect that all distilleries will keep an eye on, and they'll regularly sample the water and 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 put it for chemical analysis. Thank you. Um, for for you, Leonie, um, it's interesting about the cornerstones because uh, further up in Glenbeg, there's two abandoned cornerstones, possibly of a different date. But there's obviously been a cottage industry cornstone production. Yeah, I mean, cornstones are used throughout the centuries. You know, they're anything from even predating what we have on site and they're used up till very, very recently. Um, so cornstones on their own are often quite hard to, to date, which is why we have to look at the context and where they're in. So the cornstones that we've found from the radiocarbon dates and the features in which they're sat, we can say that they were of used and produced in, in the late Iron Age, but um, unless there's anything surrounding um, them, we're not necessarily able to date cornstones because they have been used so frequently. Thank you. Um, with regard to the, the smelting and work, have you got any idea what it was being produced? Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't often, well, part of the problem is that in Scottish soil, metal doesn't often survive. And obviously, if you're creating metal objects, they would have probably been your most precious possession. So you would probably have taken them with you if you were moving around. So it's fairly rare that you actually get the metal objects that have been created surviving and kept. Um, but I would hazard a guess to say that they were, would be be making anything um, like um, knives or shears or uh, I can't say the word th thist thistles no um, the thing you use to cut the the grains um, scythe oh, sorry yeah 
<laughs> totally not. <laughs> um, but yes, it would have been objects like that that you would have probably used for agricultural or, you know, any metal things that you might be using in your house. It could have been for jewelry as well, but there's no evidence of like precious metal working, but it could be anything. Um, we did um, have one um, possible nail come from one of the roundhouses, um, structure C by the river. So it could have also been, you know, rivets and nails that they were creating to hold up, to hold up and hold together their um, structures. Were you disappointed perhaps that there were no artifacts, no, no pottery, no, obviously no treasure hoard or anything, no, <laughs> no, no real evidence of you know, I, things people used? I think um, unfortunately when you've worked in Scotland, um, you'd, it's, yeah, I'm not saying lower your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> but it is the the rare times when you find the treasures and that's why um hordes and things um that when you do find them why it makes them even more special and even more interesting so i think the fact that we have evidence for struct uh, for settlement as well as metal working is as much as we could hope for and i think it's a it's a great result you know when you when you start these things you have a, an empty agricultural field, you could have an entire field of nothing, you could have an entire field packed with stuff. And we have had a very good mix of interesting archaeology that's both structural and we do have the finds and as in the querns. Um, um, so that's, I found that very, very fascinating and interesting. Oh, I think, I think, it, I think it's wonderful giving us, because it gives us that kind of continuity from from stone age right through and we're beginning to pick up in the in the seventh century and so on the comings of christianity and we're beginning to talk about saint columba's visit and saint figure and so we begin to add pieces into the, into the story and it makes it makes it really exciting and of course a lot of questions still to be answered like what did they do with that grain did they find somewhere Way of distilling it. Were they were they were they, were they well ahead of Gordon McPhail and the <laughs> businesses that they were setting setting up there? Well, there's always the possibility, but yes, it's a very interesting thing. And the late Iron Age is a fairly understudied and underrepresented um, Scottish archaeology, and especially for the Spey Valley, there's not been a lot of uh, sites and features found that have been dated to this period. So it enhances our archaeological um, record. And as with anything, it probably raises as many questions as it answers, but it's just it's very interesting and good to have this um, data. Yes, I think, I think you've added enormously to our, to our knowledge. And any last questions? In which case, I really want to thank everyone. I want to thank, well, first of all, the John here who, who provided that, that pictorial background, Peter and Graham who let you in and will let you out. No, I, I, I jest. And of course, biggest thanks of all in house school to Dave here who's kept this show on the road and I've been immensely impressed with the technology and the knowledge and <laughs> whatever else and I know how many hours he's put in to getting this set up so that it works so many many thanks Dave And to our, our guest speakers, and the, I know it's all, all of these things have got to be prepared and it takes time. And we're, we're adding this on to the end of your working week on a, on a Friday night. And so it's, a, it's an added imposition. But uh, Leone and your team, thank you very much. You've given, you've given us a, a, a wonderful evening knowledge, information and insight into that. Thank you. 
Thank you for having me. Thanks to Matthew and Ewan who've uh, made this possible because obviously without, without their input and their support and encouragement and enthusiasm, this wouldn't have happened. So again, thank you to Gordon and McPhail for this opportunity and this insight. Thank you. Now, I wonder if, if I can come back in because Just, just, just to finish, another, another view of Karen in its agricultural setting. So this brings us to almost the end of our evening. I, th I think it's been, it's been a, a really exciting, exciting in the, in the, in the technology of it that we could, we could actually achieve this with, with folk from all around the country and a room full of people here. I think that's. That, that's really quite quite spectacular. Um, the group I also want to thank most heartily is yourselves for coming, because it would have been a bit of a thin evening with just us sitting here talking to the microphones and uh, hoping that we'll manage to beam someone in. So thank you all for coming. We do hope that uh, you'll keep on coming. We've got, we haven't quite sorted out next year's program yet, but we're working on it and all suggestions and ideas are welcome. We've been toying with different ideas. One, we've got lots of walks and tours and heritage trails around here in the Dalha Way, the Speyside Way, local walks, local trails. And we're, we're toying with the idea of having some sort of forum looking at all these. Another possibility is those who have been glued to their televisions this week will have seen Paul Martin's first instalment of The Spay. You might also, the sharp-eyed amongst you, have seen at the foot in the credits the Grand Town Society because we had a, a finger in making that or providing background for that programme and so we're working on getting Paul to come and talk to us about how, how it was made. That might take a bit of cunning, but we haven't finished yet. We do happen to know that he's got a granny in teen. And that's, <laughs> that's a very useful contact. <laughs> he, won't, he won't escape. Other, other than that, we have two, two events coming up within the next week. Um, I'll ask John perhaps to talk about Sundays. Um, Sunday, I'm doing a guided walk uh, meeting at the Southwest Car Park in the High Street, uh, down through uh, down to the Bayon Pool and along to the Island Cemetery, and then along the banks of the Spey to the periphery of the Cairn Distillery. We're not going into it, just viewing it from the perimeter fence and back again. So between one o'clock and three o'clock on Sunday. You're all welcome. And having enjoyed that, I've gone to up the river on Thursday afternoon. We've got a chance to go down the river. We're having a, an informal meeting in Grand Town East on Thursday afternoon, but we're, we're starting that in, in the Spey Avenue car park going down through Miss Grant's garden, down to the new bridge and the military defences over that, past the Dyer's Wade and down through the planned settlement of Spey Bridge, across the old bridge to Downtown East, we'll leaving at half past one and coming back about half past three with uh, either a guided walk coming back or the possibility of transport back. It's always nice to ask, isn't it? 
other, other than that, we have, a, we have a whole lot of activities going on and there's always opportunities for people to come and help. We've got sort of four, four main projects which we're, we're working on. We've got our town centre project where we're collecting up our, our resources and looking at all the buildings and the high streets and mapping that out so we can have a, a digital high street. We've got our active travel project for which on next Tuesday we have to put in our bid for our next 35,000 or so from Sustrans to carry out the next piece of work. We are are of course busy building up a portfolio of heritage tours and trails and gradually beginning to get to get those out so that more people can share them. That was of course the basis of our winter's talks. And then our resources work where we have a, a huge amount of heritage, environmental, cultural resources within and connected with this community and we need we need to be able to collect them up together to make them much much more accessible and help to promote Grand Town by by promoting its walks and its trails and its heritage and so on so all of those anyone who feels in any way that they can they can come and help whether they can draw a picture or tell a story whether they can come and help at a at a stand Oh, and we'll be at uh, we'll be at Grand Town this Christmas in the square as well for two days. So come along and talk to us then. Other than that, thank you very very much for coming, and we look forward to seeing you very soon. And again, thank to thanks to our our guests. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you all. And I'll say good night. Yep. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. And it's going to snow next week, so be careful on that roof. <laughs> <laughs>